2 Thessalonians chapter 3. Let's dive back in. 2 Thessalonians chapter 3. Look at verse 6. Now, Paul says, Now we command you, brethren, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you withdraw yourselves from every brother that walketh disorderly and not after the tradition which he received of us. Now that you know, when Paul uses the word now, you know that it indicates something's different, something's changed, okay? Uh, there's been a progression, if you will. Um, and, and the rest of the passage bears greater meaning, okay? Because of that word now, all right? Now, you got to remember, I, see now I can't stop saying now. Now, that's like when you say like, like, you know, like. Well, now, uh, remember that Paul spoke with authority as an apostle, okay? because he was commissioned as an apostle. After he was saved, the Lord Jesus said, no, you're my dude. And so, um, he had been commissioned by the Lord himself, and he had been given a new message. Now, turn with me to Galatians chapter 1, uh, just real quick, Galatians chapter 1. Uh, Galatians chapter 1. After Paul was saved, at that point, you've got to remember, where is Jesus? He's in heaven. He's ascended. He's sent the Holy Spirit. He's in His heavenly glorified state. He saves the Apostle Paul down here on earth. Okay, But, after that moment in time, Paul is going to have conversations with the Lord in his ascended state. This was a divine thing. It was a miraculous thing. Okay? I cannot tell you if it was a literal, physical thing. I do know this. God is fully capable, just like He was John the, with John the Revelator, when John was, as he said, you know, in the Spirit on the Lord's Day, he was able to do the same thing with the Apostle Paul, and in a very real sense, according to 2 Corinthians chapter 12, whether in the body or out, he did not know. Remember that? It was so real, he couldn't tell if it was a dream or if it was like actually happening on the earth. Same thing happened with the prophet Ezekiel. Okay, by the river uh, Kibar back in, back in the Old Testament times, okay? God is able to transport people in a very real way and communicate with them, okay? He did that with the Apostle Paul and gave him a new and distinct message. Here's how we know. Look at Galatians chapter 1, verse 11. Paul writes, But I certify you, brethren that the gospel or the good news which was preached of me is not after man, for I neither received it of man, neither was I taught it, but what? By the revelation of Jesus Christ. So this was a very real thing. According to 2 Corinthians chapter 12, he said, man, these are things that are unlawful to speak. And that's kind of a little bit of a play on words because very literally to many, it seemed like it was against the law of Moses, although it wasn't. It was just establishing it, okay? But Paul received this message that is new and unique and distinct from the Lord Jesus Christ by revelation. This is why Paul says, come back now to 2 Thessalonians chapter 3. Sorry. This is why Paul says in 2 Thessalonians chapter 3 verse 6, he says, Now we command you, brethren, watch this, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. When Paul makes a statement like that, he is telling you, the words I am sharing with you, although now this is a different term, it is yet the Word of God, because I received it from the Lord Jesus Christ. So understand, when, the Paul, when, when Paul is speaking, when the Apostle Paul is speaking, he is speaking in the authority of the Lord Jesus Christ Himself. Okay? So even though it's new and different doctrine from the rest of the Bible, it is very authoritative. And he says back in Galatians, I certify you, brethren. Okay? So now, Paul gives a new command, which he has directly received from the Lord Jesus Christ. Let me pause here. I meant to make this note. And, and I did a word search just to kind of discover this. Among. The Apostle Paul used the word now 144 times in his writings. 
That's unique. That's pretty powerful. And, and it's a bit of a, it's a linguistic sort of tell, if you will. And what it tells us is that much of, if not all of what the Apostle Paul is now writing and sharing with the world is different because it's now here. And as he said in Ephesians 3, this was hidden since the world began. Now it's revealed through him. Okay? So Paul gives this new command which, which he's received directly from the Lord Jesus Christ. And what is the command that he gives? Now look at verse 6 again. He says, Now we command you, brethren, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that ye withdraw yourselves from every brother, that is, saved person, from every brother that walketh disorderly and not after the tradition which he received of us. So this now command is to withdraw from every brother that walketh disorderly. Now, to my knowledge, and, and I, I tried my best to search a bunch of different terms, okay, to test this out. How unique is this command? Okay? And to my knowledge, God never commanded Israel or commanded the Jews to withdraw themselves from another Jew. With the exception of stoning them when they broke the law for, in certain situations. That's a real that's a real withdrawal. <laughs> We're gonna withdraw you from the earth. Okay. <laughs> but remember, this was a this was a really significant thing back here when God built the nation Israel as this separate and distinct people. And he says, Come out from among them. I mean, he wanted them to be different. They were very much an exclusive club, okay? They were an elite sort of group uh, in this world. And so if, if God said, hey, y'all need to, you know, if you get one in here that's that's kind of crazy, you need to withdraw yourself. Then they start to go and then they start to branch off. It gets crazy. He's trying to keep them together. In this situation, today, under the terms of the dispensation of the grace of God, right now, he has put the, the program for the nation Israel and the terms of that. He's pushed pause on that. So today, there's neither Jew nor Gentile. God is not honoring that distinction today because under the terms of the dispensation of the grace of God, you're either a believer in Christ or you're not. Okay? And so you're not coming in and out of Israel. That's not what's going on here. Okay? You're either in the body of Christ or out. Now, if you're in the body of Christ, because notice he says here, this is to, he commands you to, to withdraw yourself from a brother that walks disorderly. So within the body, if, you, there, if there is a brother or sister, a believer in that church body that is walking disorderly, what are you to do? Withdraw. Okay? Withdraw. And so... Um, but this, is that not saying to withdraw from people that are going back to the, to the old ways? Okay, so... Teach the old ways, and then why... And it says that not after the tradition. Why would it use you the are word so, tradition? You are so wise, Rita. Yeah, but... Because <laughs> this is how this all works together. Okay, this is how this all works together. You know, not only is this unique in you because Paul says now, but then just what you keyed in on there, Paul sort of, he sort of defines what disorderly is. And in his terms, disorderly is something that is not according to the tradition that he has laid down. Now, here's what we know from looking at this timeline. The tradition that the Apostle Paul is going to establish in the terms of the dispensation of the grace of God is different than what you find back here in the Gospels or in the Old Testament, the law. Okay? And so it's unique in that, but it, 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 he kind of goes a little deeper than that. It's not, just, it's not just a doctrinal difference thing. Okay? Because as you continue with the context, he's going he's gonna to further define what he means by disorderly. But you're right. We start there. I mean, it, it's obvious. Let's say, you know, let's say somebody comes and joins our little fellowship here and by joining by the way we don't 
baptize you into our fellowship here. Um, you just kind of show up and we sort of vet you out over time whether or not you know, you're know you sincere in your belief, right? That's kind of how this works. It's really informal. Uh, you don't, by the way, you don't have to have a Sunday school rule to have a membership. Okay, that's not, not necessary. You don't even have to have a, you know, a, a, you don't have to be incorporated. You don't have to have, you know, bylaws and all that stuff uh, to have a church. We're a spiritual organization, okay? And so, um, forgot where I was going with Oh, but let's assume somebody came in, and over time we realize oh, this person has trusted in the work of Jesus for their salvation. They're a member of the body of Christ, right? But then, as time moves on, they begin to really push doctrinally in a direction that is not consistent with the rightly divided word of truth. What are we to do? Hmm? Withdraw. Withdraw. But now, as we continue to read, it is never, and this is where we've got to remember how God has treated us, it is never with the end goal of excommunicating and writing off forever. And I would even add to this, because Paul talks about walking in wisdom toward them that are without in Colossians. I would also say that does not need to be an immediate decision. This needs to be something with a lot of prayer, a lot of consideration, a lot of study, and a lot of patience, and this thing we call mercy. Because, hey, are y'all ready? I do not have it all worked out yet. Okay? <laughs> uh, none of you do. And so we have to be careful there. Okay? And so um, where do we draw the line though? At what point do you say, okay, you've, you've crossed this line. What line? Well, let's just say they, they reject the idea of right division. That's a big deal. Or let's say they reject the notion of salvation by grace through faith alone. And they come in and they say, no, you've got to be water baptist. I'm sorry, no. It's, you know that that is a that's sort of a fundamental a basic thing where yeah, we go. If you have no. a person coming in and not trying to necessarily teach something different, they're just listening. Mm -hmm. That's a different deal. Yeah, yeah, that's a different deal. Because if they're listening, you know, then something <clears throat> might ping. That's right. So you yeah. wait on it. But when you get one coming in, it says, "No, that's not right." Yeah, keep reading though, Rita, because when you get down to the end of verse eleven, Paul characterizes these people as busybodies. Let me, let me put it like this. Nosy people that like to meddle. Yeah. That's what that is. Stirred. Stirred. That can be up in front of people. That can be within the congregation. Kind of these behind the scenes conversations and these little side topic conversations, manipulations, divisiveness, scheming, a lot of things. And let me tell you, this is real. This is real. Every church, every church has to deal with this. Okay? And so, it's a real deal. Um, you know, there's a the, the tricky word in that verse is traditions because we yes. think traditions is what Israel had, and, and a lot of churches have their own traditions. But I think that's the word that trips people out. This is why the word now is so important. Okay, because when Paul says now, he's saying the traditions and the doctrines that are now given to you by the authority of Jesus Christ. So do you relate the traditions more as doctrine then? Yes. Okay. Yes. I, I cannot emphasize enough, and, and Lynn, I thought about this a lot this week because of the, the question, the, the thought we had last week about the, um, the Lord directing our hearts. You know, I cannot stress enough the centrality of the Word of God in all of this today. God's ministry today to humanity is through His Word. It is not through our feelings. It is not through our intuitions. It is not through the alignment of the stars. And it's certainly not through the you know message boards on Facebook or whatever, zodiac signs and all that garbage. It's not, hey, it is not exclusively through prayer. You know, I grew up in the days of Henry Blackaby experiencing God. Y'all remember that program back in the day? And Henry Blackaby was big on this, this 
triple-headed monster when you wanted to determine what was God's will there were like these three beacons and when they lined up you knew that's the direction you want to go one was the word one was prayer and one was the church and when they all aligned and said the same thing then you could confirm that okay this is the way I need to go that sounds great grand and wonderful except if the church isn't right at dividing the word of truth you're going in the wrong direction you may think they're aligning they ain't aligning okay what it'll align to is confusion okay and so you got to be really careful here. God is working through His Word. And His Word dictates that today we are under the dispensation of the grace of God since the time of the Apostle Paul. And that will end. And we know this through a rightly divided uh, study of the Scripture. This dispensation will end with the catching up of the body of Christ to their heavenly inheritance. Okay? When that time comes, the dispensation of the grace of God will come to a close. Okay, and then it'll change. It'll be different again, and so, um, so yeah, it's really important when we talk about these traditions. And Paul says disorderly here. Look at it again in verse six. Now we command you, brethren, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you withdraw yourselves, uh, withdraw yourselves from every brother that walketh disorderly. And watch this. So there's there's sort of a duplication here, but it helps explain the word disorderly. And not after the tradition which he received of who? Us. Paul is very intentional about saying, if you didn't hear it from me, then it ain't the right tradition. Okay? Really, really important. He has now established um, with authority from the Lord Jesus Christ the traditions that we are to follow. So... Some, and again, someone that's, that's not willing to follow the newly established tradition that the Apostle Paul has laid out, uh, or that he has even demonstrated, by the way, is to be left alone, to be avoided, to be estranged, if you will. Now, why does Paul say it like that? You know, if they don't follow me, my traditions, then you need to withdraw. Is, is Paul, is he just full of himself? You know, is he kind of cocky? I mean... Uh, how can he be so bold about demanding allegiance? Well, uh, look at verse 7. He kind of says it again here. He says, For yourselves know how ye ought to follow us. He points himself a lot. Go with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. <coughs> 1 Corinthians chapter 11. And verse 1. All right, be ye followers of me, even as I also am of Christ. I've heard this preached so many times where preachers try to be like big and bad. <laughs> and like, y'all follow me, I'm going I'm to I'm lead you right, you know. Uh, no, that ain't what he's talking about here. He literally means, y'all follow me because Jesus has said, you got to follow me. <laughs> uh, because my, my doctrine is a, is a big deal here. Um, but, but Paul commands obedience to his doctrine because he's, he's speaking the Lord's will. That's why he always says, you know, uh, uh, this is the word of the Lord Jesus himself, you know. Um, again, it was, it was given to him to establish. Y'all go with me to Colossians chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1. Paul says to follow him because God has said, Paul, you are going to the Gentiles. They need to follow you. Okay? So let me, let me cut to the chase here. Be real simplified for a minute. Y'all listening? Everybody listening? I remember the first time Truman said this to me. It just it rocked my world. Okay? Paul is your apostle. Not Peter. Not James. Not John. Paul, the apostle Paul, he, singular, is your apostle. Okay? That does not mean you ignore the rest of the Bible. The rest of the Bible, we've got to have it all. We've talked about this before. But today... 
the instruction for how you are to live your life as a believer today comes from your apostle, the apostle Paul. Okay? Look at Colossians chapter 1, verse 25. This is one of many examples, but Paul says, Whereof I am made a minister according to the dispensation of God, which is given to me for you to fulfill the word of God. Okay, what he's talking about there is the Apostle Paul, part of his ministry was to bring to fulfillment, or, bring, or excuse me, to fill to the full, or to bring to completion the Bible. Part of his responsibility and his duty as an apostle was to write the very words that the Lord Jesus Christ breathed. Okay, and so that's what he did. All right, but that was given to you, okay? That's you, Gentiles, us, all right? So today, because God has, has issued a new dis dispensation, we're not to operate under the old. Listen, preachers and teachers, bless their hearts. They, they, many just don't know different. They really don't. There, there's a lot of ignorance on this. There's a lot of denying the significance of the Bible when it says to rightly divide the word of truth. They want to try to put you under the Beatitudes. They want to try to put you under the Sermon on the Mount. And they ignore passages like Romans chapter 15, verse 8, that where Paul says, Jesus was a minister unto the circumcision for the truth of God to confirm the promises made unto the fathers. When Jesus was preaching here, He was preaching to Israel, for Israel, concerning Israel's future. And it was a lot of law. It was a lot of obligation. It was a lot of do this, don't do this. And those are completely different terms than what we are under today under our apostle, the apostle Paul. Okay? That is significant. That is important. And so, to try to put somebody under the terms of the old, okay, is actually teaching them to be disobedient. Which is crazy. Because these people tend to be very religious. They have a lot of passion and zeal for the Lord, seemingly so. But they're actually living in disobedience. And honestly, because of that, it's sin. And why is that? Because the Word has dictated that today, these are the traditions we are to operate by. Okay? And so, it's just well, a... Not only that, that's actually the way you, you obtain salvation. Absolutely. That gets kind of scary. Be careful with that thought. How can you be careful with it? I mean, Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, If our gospel be hid, it be hid to them which are lost. That's a scary thought. And where you get into, you get into this little sticky scenario where you go, okay, well, so over there at Launch Point right now, you got a lot of just sweet people. They're singing songs about Jesus. They're preaching from the same Bible that you and I are looking at for the most part. They've heard the gospel. They've heard at least that Jesus died for their sins, and that He was buried and He rose. And you got people that have actually believed that, and then they've also had some additions to that, the baptism, the giving, the serving, the going, the missions, the deacon, and all this other stuff, right? But there are some that are saved, right? But they're not rightly dividers. And y'all, this is a lesson we all need to grapple with and understand. To be saved means you trusted in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. You don't have to rightly divide the word of truth to be saved. That's a tough little issue to figure out where you slice it at, okay? Uh, because when Paul says, if our gospel be hid, it be hid to them which are lost. What all does that include, right? And so it can be tricky. But I do know this. Within our fellowship, and this is really important at Liberty Bible Church, we all have a responsibility to sort of be gatekeepers in a sense, Okay? We've got to be careful that we maintain the traditions that are established by the doctrine here in, in the Apostle Paul's writings. And not give up on it. 
Now, there are going to be places in there as we get more and more precise and hone in our doctrine where we're, we're going to be working things out. We just had a question in our break that, like, I don't know yet. I don't know the answer to. And we could probably have a debate about it. Um, as far as I'm concerned, it's not a primary issue. Primary issue would be, okay, do you rightly divide the word of truth? Do you believe that the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ alone is what it takes to be saved? I mean, those are primary issues. Secondary and tertiary issues are, you know, will Gentiles be saved in the tribulation and how? I don't know. <laughs> okay, we can look at it, we can study it, it'll be a cool study, but I don't know. Right now, what I need to focus on and really put a lot of emphasis on is how in the world we get saved today, okay? And let's clear some confusion. All right. Is that what he's talking about when he, when he says, what you're just talking about Launch Point or any other church? Is their brethren, mm -hmm. yep. so they're believers, but they're they're adding all this other stuff in that is causing them to not follow what Paul has been teaching. Yes, so this is where you got to be careful not to pull this out of context. Come back to Second Thessalonians chapter three. Now, there are other portions of Paul's writings where he does talk about give yourself wholly to his doctrine. And to do that, and I can tell you all this, when I was pastoring before here, the church I was pastoring at, I went through this real conundrum, how long do I hang in here and try to change this place? Yeah. And eventually I fell down to the situation where, where I read the word and it says give yourself wholly to this doctrine. To, to Paul's doctrine. I could not do that in my context. I couldn't anymore. I was incapable in my own ability to do that. So that's when the final decision is like, okay, it's time to break. Okay? Everybody has those different places. You have to be careful here that you don't understand Paul in verse 6 when he talks about, you know, withdraw yourself from these disorderly brethren, that you assume that means in this case he's talking about those who think different than what Paul teaches because of what he says as we continue on down. So let's keep reading. Uh, what is it you know, we're specifically doing? He says, For yourselves know how ye ought to follow us. Notice the colon there. For we behave not ourselves disorderly among you. Then you get another colon. So he's going to explain even more what he means about being orderly versus disorderly. And he says verse 8, Neither did we eat any man's bread for naught or for nothing, but wrought or worked with labor and travail night and day, that we might not be chargeable to any of you, not because we've not power, but to make ourselves an example unto you to follow us. For even when we were with you, this we commanded you, that if any would not work, neither should he eat. So specifically in the context of this passage, when Paul is talking about being disorderly in the type of person you withdraw from, it is the person who is not willing to carry their own weight. Also with that, as you get into verse 11, it's not just that they're not so concerned with carrying their own weight, but now they've gotten into the business of meddling in other people's business too, and they're divisive in that sense. Okay, now, it's kind of yes and no. In this passage, he's specifically talking about withdrawing yourself. I'm going to just simplify for a minute. Withdraw yourself from the lazy person. I'll just call it that for a minute. But as you broaden out to the Apostle Paul's writings, all of them, it also carries with it the notion that those who are teaching and acting against his doctrine, we are also to separate from that as well. But it is for a real purpose. Notice here, keep reading verse 11, For we hear that there are some which walk among you disorderly, working not at all, but are busybodies. Now them that are such we command and exhort by our Lord Jesus Christ, that with quietness they work and eat their own bread, but ye, brethren, be not weary in well-doing. And if any man obey not our word by this epistle, note that man, okay, and have no company with him that he may be ashamed. That sounds terrible, right? But the next verse is so crucial because this gets at the heart of grace. And the heart of grace says this, Yet count him not as an enemy, but admonish him as a brother. The word admonish means to warn. Pull them aside and say, Brother, you're in danger here, man. 
you're really tinkering with something and you're doing a bad thing and you need to you need to make a change here. And if you don't, it's going to be more aggressive how we deal with it. Okay? So Brian, don't you cross me. You hear me? <laughs> I'm kidding. Man, I'm scared of Brian now, you know. <laughs> so we, we have to be careful how we handle these things, right? Um, but the idea here is that in in what, what tends to happen and what can destroy a body is relational backbiting and scheming and divisiveness. And this is why. You've got to remember, too, when it comes to the survivability of the Apostle Paul's message, it's based very much in this people group that are disseminating this information. And if we break down and fall apart, where's the rest of the world going to hear this message? Where are they going to see it? You know, this is such a witness to people and a testimony to people when they come here and they see this because it's so different. Poor Bryce back there, he's thinking, man, all they do is sit here and read the Bible. And even though that dude, I can tell you, he, he's a sharp looking guy, by the way. Man. He's reading, got his shirt tucked in, he's a good looking fella right there. Even though I can tell he's been around the Bible, so this is different. We hadn't sung a song yet. He's probably thinking, we don't even love the Lord. We had not taken up an offering, you know? We had not done any of that stuff. The deacons hadn't come down to lead us in prayer and all this stuff. I, hey, by the way, at the end of this thing, what I'm going to say is, all right, y'all get out of here, and we will have an invitation. I don't even have a baptistry. I don't even know if there's a body of water other than maybe a nasty, muddy puddle out there with some bugs in it. I, you know, I... Hey, we got bugs in here. Anyway. Yeah, we got, we're, we're getting baptized by bugs around here, you know, so... Uh, things are different. But this is a... This is a, for lack of a better term, this is sort of a living witness of what it looks like to be a body that is based on the doctrines of the Apostle Paul. Okay? We are very much an undefined, defined group. What defines us is the lack of the boundary that you typically would get from following the law. You know? Um, and so this is a unique thing. And so this is why Paul is very intentional about squelching this busybody business because it, it starts to break down the, the message sender. Okay? You are a powerful force on this earth. And by the way, this little church here, I brag on this all the time, and I just think it's fun. We go from Coleman to Trinity, to Killen, up here on the mountain back 40, right here in Tuscumbia. We've had some from Tupelo. So our tendrils really reach out there, and that's not counting you two. And so if this breaks down, you think about the impact that it's having and how that will draw up. It'll go away. Okay? And so it's important that these things are dealt with, not just the doctrinal differences, but also the social and the relational things that happen and, and keeping the peace, so to speak. Um, it's very important for us to do that. So we're to live an orderly life that is distinguished by hard work, um, and, and, and we're to carry our own weight, and we're to do so quietly and not be busybodies and trying to you know, nosy in everybody else's business and, and you know, all that kind of stuff. Um, there's something else that I'll, just a quick, this is a bit of a side note, but I think it's worth mentioning here. Back in, uh, la, 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 where is it, uh, verse 8, Paul says, Neither did we eat any man's bread for naught. In other words, if he got food from some of the people there in Thessalonica, he, he got it not for free. He, he told them, and then now I'm sure they probably offered, Oh man, come on, we, we got you covered. No, we're going to work for it, okay? And that's what he'd say. Um, he, and he said, But we wrought with labor and travail night and day that we might not be chargeable to any of you. That word wrought there, um, it, it does mean to work, but it means to make gain. Okay? Let me say this to you because I know we've got some business people in here and that kind of stuff, and we're all, everybody here works. It is okay to make gain gain. Look, and I will say this. It's okay if you get wealthy doing that. Praise God. It is. 
In fact, I encourage you. Everybody go out there and get rich. Okay. <laughs> now, bring lots of yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, that's not an evil thing. Okay. Uh, in fact, I think it's a noble thing. And it's a, it's a headache too, but it's, it's a noble thing. But I want you to notice how they worked and, and went about trying to, you know, make gain. It says there, with labor and travail. The word labor there, this is actually kind of humorous, literally means to take a beating. What? To take a beating. Okay? So you make gain by taking a beating, and then travail means a hard labor. So here's the truth. Work. Okay? Work, even if it's something you like doing. Okay? Okay? It is a hard beating. Now, for our young ones, okay, I want you to listen to me. Y'all go ahead and get over that stupid notion that tells you life is going to be easy. <laughs> it's going to punch you in the teeth every day of your life. Get over it. <laughs> Learn to deal with it now. Get over it. I'm not saying anything I haven't already told my kids, by the way. It's, it's quite depressing at times, but it does not need to be depressing. Because what does Paul tell us here in verse 13? He says, But ye, brethren, be not weary in well-doing. And the reason why he can say that is because he is assured of what Jesus has told him, and that is that it's not all for naught. In your taking a daily beating at your job or your work, understand that all around you there is potential to communicate. There is potential to do a work that is greater than the thing that fills your wallet, but instead stores the treasure where it's going to really, really count. So get out here. Get after it. Get to your own business and do it. Do it with passion. Do it with zeal. Do it to the best of your ability. Don't do it halfway. Get out there. Get after it. Rock and roll. Okay? And when you take the gut punch, <clears throat> tense up and just keep going. <laughs> Go buy a hot tub. Relax at night. <laughs> okay? But it's going to be a meeting. Keep going. But working, even if you enjoy it, it, it is. It's a hard being, but I want to close with this. And y'all turn back with it. Take a left turn and go to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. So that you don't just have to hear it from me. Okay? Listen to the Apostle Paul here. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 Come all the way to the last verse of the chapter. Verse 58. And Paul says this, Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as ye know that your labor, your daily beating, is not in vain. That is a promise that you have. And by the way, in the context there, this body that you're in right now is going to take a beating. The stress will hammer you to death. I mean, it is going to wear you up. But guess what? Part of your promise is you'll get a new one. Hallelujah. Okay? You have a real promise from the Lord God Almighty according to the terms of the dispensation of the grace of God. So get out there. Get to work. Keep your head down. Keep your mouth shut. That's hard for me to do and work, but do so as unto the Lord. Everything is unto the Lord. Let's pray now. We'll be dismissed. Father, we love you. I'm grateful to be here today um, to study, to tackle the truths of your Scripture, Lord, and to understand it, to grow from it. Father, we have a huge task out there as, as um, we go about our lives as we have work to do, not only just in our jobs and providing for our families and you know paying bills and just doing all the ordinary things of this life, 
we have a commission as believers and members of the body of Christ to be ambassadors for you. In, we're in enemy territory. We know that we are <laughs> we're fighting a losing battle in some senses because we know we're outnumbered. But Father, it's not a loss for us because we, of the promise you've given us. Um, we're not promised ease. We're not promised earthly wealth. We're not promised any of that. What we are promised, O oh Lord, is a heavenly inheritance that we know for sure we can hang our hat on and we can look forward to. And I pray in that, God, that you direct our hearts into the love of God that you have for us. And, and help us to be motivated by that. Help us to be driven to serve you with passion and zeal every single day, even when it gets hard. And in those moments where we feel like giving up, Lord, just to take a moment pause and just talk to you about it. Lord, we thank you that you have blessed us so richly, that you have given us a heavenly inheritance, and that you've given us something to look forward to. And God, you have given us. You've given us an incredible mission and purpose in this life on this earth right now. Help us to realize it, Lord. Lord, we love you. Jesus, we thank you. And it's in your name we pray. Amen. Get out of here! <laughs>